Thanks, first of all, I'm going to thank the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. So, let me first say, I see a number of senior people in the audience. This seems like you're not able to do. Uh, so, if, uh, if you find them a bit basic, then I'd be careful. This is a graduate student. Uh, and what I want to do is to discuss concepts that I think anybody knows are really important representation here symmetry and duality. Now we can discuss these and study them at a very general level using the idea of categories. Okay, so uh, the notes for uh, this lecture series are posted at this link. Uh, what I'm going to do here is on these slides, I pull sort of pieces and equations out of these notes, and I'll go through and I'll annotate them. But uh, that link is sort of a more detailed version of like full sentences, and uh, so that is the thing that's posted. And please, as I just said, feel free to stop me at any point and ask a question. So uh, let's just start off with the basics. So we're going to work over a field throughout this whole theory. K will be on the field throughout the week, and N will be the set of non-negative integers. So uh, what we're interested in is the normal categories. And simplifying things, we're going to see our normal categories, so let's get a string. So probably everybody has seen the neural categories in some sense, even if you have a bit of abstractly with the definition of a neural category, everyone's seen tensor products. If you're and you're working in some sense where you've got tensor products, you're probably working in Okay, so let's just make this a little bit formal. So that's correct when I look at it. So it's some category C. Uh, and we'll assume for those here of these things, all our categories are small set of objects. Okay. There's some category T, and it's equipped with uh, a bifunctor, which we call the tensor product, which goes from two copies of this category to the category. Right? So it takes two objects, and then to them gives another object, and same for morphisms, take a tensor product in morphisms. And we've got a particular object called the unit object, which we'll always denote by a whole phase one. I'll always get a unit object in whatever category we're working with. And what are the axes in this name is specified? Uh, so it should be associated on the jets. And this unit object, as the name suggests, should be a unit for this tensor product of merge. And then we have similar axes that we have. So I have them three more things. And you know, there are two ways to talk for them, two ways to put in the frequency, they should be equal. So if this is associated on one of these as well. And there's also a unit for tensor product and morphisms, and then the identity morphism of the unit object. Okay, so one sub some object will always be the identity and the marker of an object, which you have by definition. So just a little note, you know, for those of you who are so used to certain level categories, when you have usually not categories, so you take a category. Instead of just an actual uh, quality, you really have to face the markers. And if these two vector spaces with x, y, and z are vector spaces, you have an economical isomorphism between these two, which is the parentheses. And same thing for the unit object in vector spaces, this would just be the one dimensional vector space. Because if you take any vector space and turn to the one dimensional one, you get back the same vector space. We don't really get that the exact same one, but it's facing markers to that one. So you re replace these equalities here by isomorphism, uh, and then you require some compatibility between all these isomorphisms. Okay, so that's the way you're usually used to. But there's a type here in the plain coherence theorem that says that any vital category is still much of a strict one. And so in reality, you can sort of pretend that uh, all your monoidal categories are strict. And that's essentially what we'll, we'll do. It's like you don't have to write any isomorphisms there. And we'll be actually defining some conodal categories or generators and relations, and then they actually will be strict. Okay, so we'll just sort of assume everything is strict for the purposes of this, uh, these lectures. So there's a bit of uh, more structure that we want on our categories. So when we fix this ground field K, we'll want most of our categories to be K linear. Right, so what does that mean? It means that for any two objects, the set of morphisms between those two objects, in the vector space over the field K. Okay. Uh, and then we need some matches to be satisfied, so composition should be bilinear. Okay. 
So the example that you should keep in mind is again uh, vector spaces over some fixed field K. And again, if you uh, treat this as a strict monoidal category, and then uh, as you teach your students in linear algebra, you know, if you have two vector spaces and a set of map, linear maps between them is itself a vector space, then composition of these linear maps is bilinear, et cetera. Right? So that's an example of a K-linear category. Okay, so uh, you know this definition of alien or category doesn't assume an oil. And then eventually we'll put them together in a one of the And one of the important things about the oil categories that's been this whole recent notation that we'll introduce for working on them is something called the interchange law. So what is the interchange law? If we have two morphisms, morphism F and a morphism G, like this. And then we want to define a map from x1, y1 to x2, y2. There are three ways to do this, right? We can first apply g to the second factor and then f to the first factor. We can first apply f to the first factor and then g to the second factor. Or in a monoidal category, we can take a tensor product of morphisms. So we have half tensor g, which is a morphism that just goes directly from f1 tensor y1 to f2 tensor y2. And interchange law, the V are all the same, the side of it. It's not an axiom you have to put on the middle category. It follows from the fact that the tensor product is a bifactor. Okay, so, but, but this is a really important law, and I'll come back to it in a second when I introduce bring that across from another category. Okay, so that'll be the next topic I'm about to discuss. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about diagrams. So everything we're going to do in this uh, lecture series will we'll use the language of string diagrams from the best categories. So you're really the best language to use when you're discussing monoidal categories. And the essential reason is that normal categories are really you're really a two-dimensional algebra because you've got composition and you've got tensor product. And these are sort of two different types of multiplication. And you should really write them in orthogonal directions. Take the same questions here. You try and all write them all one line and take and things get more interesting. Okay, so what is the string diagram formalism for those who haven't seen it? If we have some morphism f from x to y, we'll always write morphism as going up the page. Okay, so the domain will be written at the bottom, the codomain will be written at the top. And then we'll have some sort of coupon, or it can be some sort of picture, or anything that denotes that uh, morphism. Okay. So we always think of it as reading up the page. And the identity map, the convention is if you just write this as a string with, with no decoration. Okay. Just the identity map from X to X. And as I said, the whole point of this string diagram formalism is that we're now working in two dimensions, we're trying to think of the plane. And this gives us the freedom to write. Uh, composition and tensor product in orthogonal directions. Okay, so composition would be vertical static. Okay, so if we want to write the composition of f and g, uh, we put f on top of g. Okay, but again, this is because we're reading pictures from bottom to top. So it's first the bottom of g and then the bottom of g. And tensor product is just putting two string diagrams aside. Okay, so that's the tensor product. So you see we've written them on the bottom of it. And now we start to see the benefit of this when we look at the interchange law. Right? So what I've written here on the left, if you think about it, this is F composed with the identity. I haven't bothered drawing the domain and the codomain here because it doesn't really matter. And then we compose that with identity tensor G. And that's what that left hand side is. And then the middle, what we've got here is F tensor G. And on the right, what we've got is one tensor G composed with F tensor one. So that algebraic uh, commutative diagram that I wrote before comes down to this in terms of string diagrams is that we have these equalities. So what that means is we can perform this sort of rectilinear isotopy in string diagrams, and it doesn't change the markets. We get the same markets. And that's really the key reason why string diagrams are so nice. So let me give you sort of an example to justify that further. If I draw some string diagram like this, uh, this is ambiguous, right? Because I can split it like this, and then it's 
A composed with C, tensor B composed with D. I view it that way. Alternatively, I can sort of split it this way, and then it's A tensor B composed with C tensor D. So it's not clear how you should interpret this diagram, right? Whether you should put these together vertically first and then horizontally, or horizontally first and then vertically. That's what we said. This one should be judged by that guess. Uh, but this interchange law exactly tells you that these two things are equal. And so when I draw a diagram like this is unambiguous, remember that's one more physics, it doesn't matter how you interpret it. It's a little bit like when you first teach truth theory, you tell them that group multiplication has been defined by an equation. And so if you have three elements, you have to choose how you multiply them. Uh, and then because of the associative property, you then say, well, where do you start writing like ABC? It doesn't matter how we put the parentheses together. That's uh, you know, that's why this type of notation is nice for still two good things. Uh, so the same is true for string diagrams with respect to you know, categories. This language is exactly designed to encapsulate this interchange law, and we don't have this kind of thing. Okay, so sometimes we will have morphisms where the domain and the codomain will be written as a tensor product of some objects. And so what we'll often do is we'll have either some coupon or some little picture that has various strands coming into it, which represent the factors in this tensor products in the domain. Okay, so we'll see things like things, uh, except we can be this smart. Okay, any questions on the All right, so that's sort of like a formalism. Um, the string diagrams string that we're going to use throughout this lecture uh, series. And now what I want to talk about is how you can study symmetry and duality using this language. So let's start off with symmetry. So there are lots of categories uh, that we know of that are to have a certain symmetry. For instance, the vector spaces, if you have two vector spaces, the NW. Uh, it doesn't really matter what order you take the tensor product, but they're both isolated, right? So we want to sort of capture that type of symmetry. This is also true for modules for groups or modules for linear algebras. We want to encode that type of symmetry in this formula as well as knowing categories. So what we want is we want the idea of abstract when we will abstract symmetry for the model. Okay, so this is a strict linear category where we can find the form. Eventually, we're going to see them as linear or symmetrical, but this definition is unique back then. So it's done through now in category. And then the answer to that makes it a symmetric mode of category is that for any two objects, we have an isomorphism that goes from x tensor y to y tensor x. Okay, so that isomorphism is, you should think of it as this isomorphism in this case. And so the standard notation for that isomorphism in terms of our string diagrams will be a couple of things. Okay, so this should be an isomorphism from S tensor Y to Y tensor X. Uh, and we need some axioms for this to satisfy. Uh, so first of all, we need these crossings to be natural in X and Y. I'll discuss that a little bit more uh, in a minute. Uh, and what are some other axioms we require? So let's say that one of these objects is actually the unit object. And remember that part of our axioms of a strict denial category is that any object tensor with the unit object is actually equal to that object itself, right? Not just by smart direction equal. And same thing if we do it in the other direction. So here the domain is x tensor one, so that's just x for so that diagram. The domain is x. And the codomain is also x because it's one tensor x. So this left hand side is really a morphism from x to x. So it makes sense that they have to be equal to the identity on x. Okay, so that's the approach to x here. So you should think of that as compatibility with the unit object. We want our symmetry data to be compatible with this unit object. Another compatibility we want is that if we have a crossing where one of the factors is a tensor product. Uh, it should be built out of the crossings for the individual factors. So here we have a crossing just where x crosses dead, and here we have a crossing just where x, sorry, 
the, the bottom one is y crosses z, and then the top one is x crosses z. So if you were to write that algebraically, that would say that, uh, well, if we give some notation to this cross, we say sigma, and sigma x, y, z, so that's the crossing of x times or y with z, is uh, the crossing of x with z tensor the identity of y, that's above the red line here, and then below the red line is identity of x tensor the crossing of y and z. All right, so you may sometimes see this data when it's written just purely algebraically as this type of expression, but it looks, I think, much more natural when you write it through the string diagrams. This crossing is just built out of the individual crossing. Uh, and then finally, uh, this crossing squared should be the identity. Except it's not really squared uh, because the objects change directions. So this is really sigma yx composed with sigma xy is the identity on x tensor y. So I'm going to write it algebraically. But if you write this in terms of these crossings, then everything becomes very natural. Right? So these are axioms. Any questions on these axioms? Okay, so let me just. Uh, can you turn the mic back? That's a bit better. So. It's a bit better. Yeah. Excuse me. So this third idea is uh, this idea is the key of the Right. If you omit that third axis and put the rating, then you would usually draw these things as an overcrossing and an inverse. Is an undercrossing, uh, and then you would not require this last axiom. And you know, everything I'm just going to say in this lecture series, maybe I'll mention the other, you could generalize to greater than our category of well, six C plus. Any other questions? Okay, so let me come back to this requirement I said that these crossings have to be natural in X and Y. Let me just explain explicitly what that means. So that means the following. If I have an f that goes from x to z, so I can further take this f, right? So the bottom is the domain of x, the codomain is z. So here in the middle, I could cross with z and y. Uh, you should think of this naturality as the fact that I can slide, I can slide these coupons through crossings, right? So I can slide this f, so it's up here. And notice I changed the crossing. This is a crossing of y and z. This is the crossing of, sorry, this is the crossing of yeah, z and y. This is a crossing of x and y. But you should think that you can slide things through crossings. That's the naturality. Right? And you can slide them through the other way. That's it being natural or whatever. And a special case of this so if you take that naturality and if you take this f itself to be a crossing, so here's a crossing. So that map, that coupon app is sort of a compound thing now where it's domain and codomain are tensor products. So it's this crossing. And if you slide the crossing through that other crossing, now it ends up here. And so this equality is just precisely a special case of this where F is the crossing. But you probably recognize this as the break range, right? So the symmetric mode of category has a break relation, but you don't need to put it in as an axiom. Follows from the fact that you require this thing to be natural, the two arguments. So here's a, an exercise. I've given a few exercises that we know it's supposed to do. Uh, if you go back to our definition, you may complain that there's sort of some asymmetry here. Right, so here I put the one on the right. Why didn't I put it on the left? Well, I could have. And here I've got the tensor product on the left. I went on the right. So a little exercise, you can use the existing axioms to show that you already have those things, uh, the other version of those. Uh, so you don't need to add them in, even though there appears to be the same thing. Any questions here? Okay, so an example that you should keep in mind uh, of a symmetric neural category is uh, vector spaces over some fixed field, K, 
Uh, again, modulo this uh, slight issue that there's not a strict amount of that for it. If you pretend it's a strict amount of that for it, then you're crossing the one vector space, maybe it's a vector space as well, right? You and D. So this is a map for V tensor for B to V tensor for U. And usually we'll write this as this is flip of U and B. It just takes two vectors, little U tensor little B, and sends it to V tensor D, and then you extend that in the R E. Right? And so you can check that this satisfies all these axioms of us category. The same thing is true if instead of vector space, if these are modules over some group, if your group has a diagonal action, so it commutes with this flip. And the same thing is true, so groups, I think, will be a really important example for us. And another important example is the algebras, uh, because again, you can check that the image of the lead algebra or a person doubling algebra um, commutes with this flip. Right, so if you have modules over some fixed wheel, so well, that's another example of some size. These aspects with this same flip map for your crossing. At the very end, we'll also upgrade these things to add in the word super. Uh, those can also give us examples. The only thing is you only put a little sign in here, depending on how you use all this. So there are lots of examples of symmetric metal categories. If you go to the quantum analogs, then you have to, as you said, you're so long as symmetric, you have to go to the quantum analogs. And we'll stick with the non quantum version for this topic. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, give an example of how we can use these concepts so far. We've talked about symmetry in a Monodal category, and we can start describing some categories that have some universal properties. Okay, uh, and that's going to be sort of the goal of the talk. So uh, today we're just going to cover symmetry probably, and then later on in the subsequent lectures we'll introduce duality. And our structure will always be able we'll to define what it means to have duality in a metal category. We define now symmetry, and then we'll want to define from universal categories with these properties, and then study how symmetry and duality behave in this universal setting. And then this will immediately allow some new applications when we look at it. So this will be our first example of this, but we'll create a universal category. And so far, the only property we've discussed is symmetry, so it'll be a category that has a universal symmetry property. Okay, so let's call this category category sim. So it's a strict linear monodal category. It has one generating object, which we'll denote by an up arrow. Okay, so this is our first time talking about something like a generating object. So what does that mean? You're probably all familiar with giving a group a presentation a generator generation, sort of ring, maybe an associate mm -hmm. group. Very similar to the little categories. Uh, so when we say one generating object, well, what are we allowed to do with objects? The only thing we're allowed to do with objects is take tensor products. So then when I say generating an object, I mean the objects of this category sim are just arbitrary tensor products of this one generating object. And so we can take the generating object and we can tensor it with itself as many times as we want. Of course, we can tensor it with itself zero times. We've also got the unit object. Okay, that's part of the axiom of the unit object. So that's our objects. For morphisms, we've got one generating morphism, which we'll just denote as a cross -me. And we don't need to label the bottom or the top. Uh, we can read off the domain and the codomain just by looking at orientation to the arrows or the fact that in this example, there's only one generating object. So the domain is just this generating object tensor itself. And the codomain is also this generating object tensor itself. Uh, but now, what do I mean by generating morphism? Uh, there's more things we can do with morphisms. For objects, we can only take tensor product. But for morphisms, we can take tensor product and composition. Right? So we can take this generating morphism, you can put it beside itself a bunch of times, but we also always have unit uh, endomorphisms, identity endomorphisms. So I could throw in some of those, and I can throw in some processes. I can take originally tensor products of this proxy with identity morphisms, and then I can stack them on top of each other and compose. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say I'm generating morphisms. I can build arbitrary morphisms out of this one in the identity by taking tensor products and composition. 
So you see the type of pictures that you can build. You can have these strands that can cross each other any way you want. And it's a linear pattern where it's saying that you take linear combinations of these types of pictures. Okay, so that's what the morphisms look like. Arbitrary linear combinations, but string diagrams that are built out of crossings and straight strands. And then we just propose Q relations. And the relations that we choose are the ones that we need in order for this category to be a symmetric familiar category. Okay, so this crossing should square the identity because that was one of the axioms of in a symmetric monoidal category. So if we want this to be symmetric monoidal, we need a better and always that. We need it. Uh, is that, well, this we can't see, you know, remember the other one was that if you had any uh, work as in, so if we have a, a crossing the one with this identity, then that's just the identity. That's sort of built in for free because our the convention for the identity and the morphism of the unit object is that you just don't draw it. It's just a little bit, and that's completely compatible with our axioms that if we take any object and transfer it to the unit object, we get that object back here. So you can just delete these strands that are labeled by the unit object. So that axiom works for free. But one of the other axioms in a script. Uh, symmetric monoidal category was that the crossings had to be natural in the two arguments. So when we give a presentation of a category where we have generating morphisms and we want it to be symmetric monoidal, we just need each of those generating morphisms to slide through crossings, right? And then everything will slide through crossings because they're all built out of generating ones. So when we have one generating morphism in this category, that's the crossing. So the only relation we need to put it to make this natural with two arguments is that the crossing slides through the crossing. And as we saw, that's the break relation. So we're imposing the break relation, and that's what our category this crossing data is natural in the two arguments. And that's it, that's all we need. And then it's symmetric we might have satisfied all the axioms of the symmetric. So just an example, since this is our first time working with that category, that's we give a presentation in terms of generators and relations. Uh, we can have, so there are objects of sin, as we said, are arbitrary tensor products of this generating object. And so here is an example of endomorphism of this generating object, tensor with itself, four times. Okay, so we see the four times in the fact that we've got four strands at the top and bottom. And we see that this picture that I'm drawing here is just built out of proxies and identity endomorphisms just by juxtaposing themselves uh, them beside each other horizontally and stacking them vertically. That, here's an example of one of these types of diagrams that's built out of proxies and identity maps just by uh, putting things together the top vertically. And we can take linear combinations. I can take that one and I can add it to say two times this one. Well, that's an example of an endomorphism of this object, the identity object transfer with itself more times. And then what's in each of those these relations? Uh, sometimes people call these local relations. If anytime you have some bigger string diagram and you see this type of picture locally, you can replace it by this picture. Right? And same thing for the braid relation. So we have that type of thing in our big diagram. So here we have two strands that cross each other twice. So we can use that relation, that first relation to pull these apart. And you see over here, I've gotten rid of that. Those two are not no longer crossing each other. And then you see, I have this strand that goes over here and comes back over here. And I have this strand, like this, and I can use my relations to pull these apart. And so now I can pull it out so that the red line is over here. This becomes the red one, and then the blue one is up over here. All right, so I can use these relations locally. All right, and these are the types of uh, manipulations we'll be doing with these string diagrams. We'll be giving the presentation in terms of generator relations. The generators tell us sort of what our basic pictures are that we can use to build big string diagrams, and the relations tell us what sort of local units we can use. 
So this is kind of uh, high universal properties. So what's the universal property? Uh, here's the universal property. And also another nice feature of this category. Positive integer n. And let's look at the group algebra of the symmetric group on n letters. So it, usually the way you would describe this, say algebraically, if you want to give an algebraic presentation of that group algebra, you really just need to give an algebraic presentation group. So you have these simple transpositions, the S1 up to S n minus one. And the relations that you impose to get the symmetric group are that the simple transposition which gets squared to the identity. You have the grade relation, SI, SI plus one, SI equals SI plus one, SI, SI plus one. And you have this uh, grade relation, the SI and SJ can use to find the data part part. It's their absolute value of the difference is greater than one. And uh, it turns out, it's not so easy to see that, or not so hard to see that you have a map from the group algebra of the selected group to the endomorphism algebra of n copies of our generating object. So that string diagram is that have n points at the top and the bottom. Okay. Uh, so this is just the usual way that you often draw pictures for the symmetric group. You draw them as sort of strands making commuting objects. Uh, so it's not hard to see that you have this map that all these relations will be satisfied if you spend SI to the crossing of the I and I plus first strands. You have to choose the label number, label them, so label from right to left. You can also label left to right, it doesn't really matter. You just should choose the best one business. And it's not so hard to see that you have a map, and then with a little more words, you can show them this map is actually an isomorphism. So these endomorphism algebras in this category are the group algebras of the symmetric group. So you see that this category sim has all the group algebras of the symmetric group inside it. And it puts them all together into one little category. And if you look at homomorphisms in this category uh, between tensor powers of this generating object, where you take a different number of factors, then this space is zero. Okay? Because all our generating morphisms were endomorphisms, they all the same number of strands at the top of the point. Nobody can change. So essentially, the same that these other work is now where the group algorithms of the symmetric group is capturing everything we call this neural category. It's really just a way of putting the group algorithms of the symmetric group together into one object right, or one category. But what's really nice is if you look at the presentation of the symmetric groups and you look at the presentation of this category, uh, as long as you're familiar and you're comfortable with the language of the middle categories, I would argue that the category presentation is much simpler. It's only got one generating morphism, the property, and it's only got two relations. Whether it's from the group algebra, the symmetry group, which is why you have a different presentation for each n, and for a given n, you need n minus one generators, and you need a lot of relations. Okay, so the language of the middle categories allows you to treat the symmetric group in a much easier way if you're familiar with the comfortable language of the middle categories. And so, for instance, if you look just at this distant rate relation, this follows for free. We didn't have to put this in as a relation uh, on the level of the middle categories. It's this idea that we have reference right to linear isotopy, which is the interchange law. Because if, if uh, the absolute value of i minus j is greater than one, then these crossings involve completely different strands. And so I could just slide one past the other using the interchange law. And so this just in gray relation just comes for free from the absolute with my own category. And so some of you, maybe you immediately start thinking of other algebras that have this type of relation. And there are lots of the algebras that generate algebras. Uh, and they can all also be put together into one in the category. Each time you see this sort of distant things commute property, you should think that maybe there's really a similar right category that's underlying uh, all of these algebras. Often the are definitely these algebras. Sometimes uh, you might have also seen the term the time of the algebras, people question comment where the representation theory is about the time of the algebras. And these are really in the right categories. The time of the algebras, each of the algebras in the time. Or just any more algebras. 
you've got this external obligation of pushing the temperature of the center of the plant in the internal one to the college. It's just a different language and discussing this whole thing. Okay, so what's the universal property? Uh, the universal property is the following. So this category sim is the free symmetric monomial category on one object. Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> So if you have any other symmetric monoidal category, C, and you choose any object you like in that symmetric monoidal category, then there's a unique monoidal functor from our universal one to C that takes our generating object to that object you chose, X, and it sends the crossing to the symmetry data, right? Because part of what it means to be a symmetric monoidal category is you have a symmetry data. And so that tells us where our crossing should be found. So then, uh, so that's what it means to be the free universal, uh, the free symmetric of category of function. And so it follows from this isomorphism that any time you have a symmetric neural category and you fix some object C, this factor that exists by the universal property immediately induces a homomorphism of algebras from the group algebra of the symmetric group to the endomorphism algebra of the end full tensor product of the symmetric. Okay, so this is one thing we get immediately from the universal property. And so this is the sort of the theme that we'll re return to in this question series, where we will be discussing the universal categories with more properties, like some duality properties. And again, this is any time you have a category that has those sort of the properties, there will be a factor from our universe to one to the particular one you're interested in. And that will induce these types of homomorphism. So if you know something about the kind of work is an algebra or more generally work is an algebra between different numbers of objects in your universe uh, category, it gives you some information about end of work is an algebra in the particular category you're interested in. So, for instance, uh, this category here may be the category of modules over some group, like the general linear group, you'll see. And then we'll have a, a category that maps to modules over the general linear group. And then we'll be able to study representations of the general linear group because we've already seen some things that hold in the universe category. Okay, any questions? Is this map to general? This map. Well, that depends on the category. This is so general. So general no, um, because you can take a C game in one. But uh the example of category there's later on when we have duality, we will be interested in being subjective, and it will be like for, for the general linear group, this is not. Uh, no, for the general linear group, yes, it is. If we take yeah, if you take this B say to be uh, the natural module for GLB, uh, then this is my, this is yeah, this is sure all well. Uh, so, so that will be really important for us. The reason I hesitated for a second is because later on, what we're going to do is we're going to take not only the natural module, but the dual of the natural module, uh, and then we'll have to add in some more data. We'll have to enhance our universal category to change our risk value. But if you just look at that natural module, this is subjective, and this is sure not well. Questions. Okay, so let's give an example, sort of a simple example, uh, the return example we've seen a couple of times. So if we take our category C uh, to be the category of vector spaces over some field, uh, say finite dimensional vector spaces over some field K, then uh, I said when we want to view this as a symmetric monoidal category. Uh, if we take any two vector spaces V and W, then our crossing data will be known as flip VW. And so that's just the vector space that just flips the two factors in a tensor product. You know, uh, we extend that uh, So that is a symmetric monoidal category. And therefore, by our universal property, we have a unique monoidal functor from this universal category. Uh, to the category of vector spaces, so maybe
Uh, so when I say unique, it's uniquely specified by the fact that it sends our generating object to B and it sends the crossing to that flip. Right? Once you say where those two things are at, then that uniquely specified. I do not think that there's a unique functor from sim to vector spaces because I can take any vector space I want, B, for instance. But it's uniquely determined by this uh, data. Once I tell you where the generating object is mapped, how the structure is mapped, because those are the generating objects and morphisms that category sim. And then this immediately induces the homomorphism of algebras from the group algebra of the spectrum to uh, endomorphisms of uh, the n fold tensor product of your vector space. And the same thing holds is if instead of that, we have, say, finite dimensional modules over some group, or if we pick some Lie algebra and we take, say, modules over that Lie algebra, right? And then it's the exact same flip. We don't have to change anything. The same thing holds. Any questions? Okay. So let me just give you now a preview of what we're going to do next. That's sort of all the material I wanted to make sure we got to do today. So the, the preview of what we're going to do next is we're going to introduce the concept of duality. Okay. So far, we've just discussed symmetry. So duality, we're going to have a generating object, uh, which will again go by another angle. And we're going to discuss what it means with some other object, which will usually go by a diamond angle, to be dual to that object. And in a vector space, you have the dual vector space. So we want to describe what it means for the second vector space to be dual to the first, just using the language of a monoidal categories. Right? So we give an abstract definition of duality. It'll actually look a lot like the definition of adjoint clusters. Uh, and this will also again hold for groups and for uh, modules over modules over groups or the algebras. So those also have duals. In fact, those of you know about hot algebras, we give you a lot of what we're going to discuss for hot algebras because we have rules. Uh, and then, once we define duality, we'll again give a universal uh, category that has an object and a dual object. This will be the oriented to the lead category. Uh, and then we will look at how all of this is compatible with symmetry. Right? So, how can we put symmetry and duality together and make them compatible with each other? And that will lead us to another universal category that has both of these six duality and symmetry. Uh, and then we'll look at one more thing, which is uh, sometimes an object is dual to itself. Right? So if an object is dual to itself, then we have to treat the duality and the symmetry a little bit differently. And so we'll see, we'll split it into various cases an object that's dual to itself, or that's not dual to itself. And how the symmetry is in place with the duality. So that will lead us to various universal categories, and we'll see that that will be the difference between, for instance, taking the general linear group, or the orthogonal group, or the symplectic group, because these all, so, all have different ways in which symmetry interacts with duality. So for the general linear group, the natural module is not dual to itself. Whereas for the orthogonal group, the natural module is dual to itself, because by definition, the orthogonal group preserves a non-degenerate bilinear form, and that precisely gives the duality of the object with uh, the, is the isomorphism of the duality of the object with its with its dual. And same thing for the symmetric group, right? So we'll see that these various choices of how duality can interplay with symmetry will lead us to these various definitions of universal categories. Uh, so that will be sort of occupy the next two lectures. And then the final lecture, what I want to get a little bit to is uh, very briefly is how we go to the super setting where we can talk about representation of super group, the super algebras. And then you have other types of neuralities, but not that can be isomorphic to the shift of its dual. And then you get other universal categories and uh, duality that you can have in the super setting. Okay, so that's what I have for today.